Hello, uh, is it Shubhasat Koirala? Yeah, speaking. Uh, today we had an interview call. Is it the right time we can speak? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, I'm going through your resume and uh, the current project what you're working with, is it invoicing and accounting? Yeah, it's invoicing and accounting. Okay, uh, so can you explain me what role you're playing in this project? Uh, in this project, it is more end-to-end -end role. So right from the requirement phase to design to uh, development, you know, I am a part of, of all the phases almost. So in the requirement document, uh, I was helping out my project manager to fill in the requirement documentation. So over there, you know, I was I was there coordinating with the on-site uh, customer and putting down use cases, putting down uh, whatever notes needed in the requirement documentation to make it complete. Uh, after the requirement document was done, I was a part of also of the technical phase to uh, convert the requirement to technical uh, to design. So basically. Uh, you know, I was a part of the lower level design as well as the higher level design of the technical documentation. And during the execution phase, I was responsible to help out the developers in case they have difficulties and also to do, also to do code reviews to ensure that uh, we follow all, we follow the proper coding standards, naming guidelines, etc. And then uh, as a part of support, I was helping out the developers to ensure that uh, the defects are closed and the UAT is signed off properly. Hmm. So that looks a big role you are playing this project. Oh yeah. Okay, uh, and uh, so can you explain me uh, what kind of architecture this project has basically? Uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a normal three-tier architecture uh, with like the UI, the BO and the DAL. Uh, for the DAL component, what did you use? Uh, the DAL component was a data application block from the, from the enterprise application block library of Microsoft. Okay, so, so basically it was just a simple three-tier architecture or was it something more than that? Uh, well, you know, the the three tier architecture was the base of the base of the project. Uh, you know, and uh, in uh, okay, so so basically we had three tiers: the UI, the the BO, and the DAL. And uh, the the overall architecture we had used is the model view controller. So we basically had the model, the view, and the controller uh, separating each other. Um, and you know, in various pockets of the project, we had used uh, you know different patterns like factory pattern, you know, a template pattern, etc. So. So can you explain me what what exactly is factory patterns? Uh, factory pattern is a is a type of a creational pattern. So it it helps you to basically eliminate the new keyword from your from your UI or from the entities. So in factory pattern, you basically have a class who helps you to create the objects and 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 you know you uh, from the client end or from the you know from the client end you need to use interfaces to reference the concrete objects. So basically, you have a factory class who punches out the objects and the objects are basically nothing but their references to your concrete classes. Uh, okay, and uh, so this was this was basically a Windows or a web form, or oh, it was a web form. Okay, and it was in ASP.NET and C Sharp. Uh, I'm seeing over here that it's both the languages C Sharp and BB.NET. So can you explain me why? Uh, uh, well, you know, I mean, there was some part of the coding which was done in BB.NET uh, by third parties. So, so it was it, it was more of a more 98% of C# -sharp application, but some part of VB.NET was from the third party. Okay, uh, so can you explain me uh, basically uh, what are session sessions and uh, uh, what you call what are session variables exactly? Uh, well, you know session variables are uh, uh, you know they help you to store user specific data. So basically, you know uh, if you look at the if you look at the way the HTTP protocol, it, it's more of a stateless protocol. So it it uh, you know you you send a request you get a response and the server forgets who you are. So basically uh, you know session variables help you to make uh, you know it it helps you to retain the states between the request and and store the user information. So what you know what are the various ways by which you can store session variables uh, or maintain session variables? Uh, there are basically two ways. One is an in proc and one is an out proc. So in in proc, uh, you know the session variables are stored inside the IIS memory itself. While in out proc, you can either use SQL Server or you can either use a state server. Okay. Uh, you have also used uh, WCF in your project. You have you are you are also well versed with WCF. Yeah, I have a knowledge of WCF. Okay. Uh, so what is basically WCF for? I'm going to say what's the use of WCF as such, you know. Um, uh, you know, okay, WCF is a part of uh, .NET. It's it actually initiated from .NET 3.0. Uh, 
uh, you know, you can you can think about you know uh, WCF is you know is a way to implement SOA. So it's a technology by which you can implement SOA. Or I'll rather say that it's the answer given by Microsoft to implement SOA. Uh, it's basically a communication. Uh, you know, it, it's it's basically a communication foundation. You know. Uh, which I which integrates uh, different protocols like you know HTTP uh, different protocols uh, uh, different uh, technologies I'm sorry not protocols different technologies like you know MSMQ uh, web services uh, remoting all the uh, different communication technologies into one umbrella uh, you know so uh, with WCF you know you can create services and you can expose those services by using XML. Uh, but isn't that also done by web services? I mean, to web services also you can expose your service as XML, and it is it is it same or how it is? Uh, well, you know that you know as I said, you know WCF services uh, WCF is mainly meant to uh, you know uh, to you know what you call as so, to implement SOA. So for SOA, you know one of the important things is to to have to implement the WS hyphen star specifications. If you look at web services, right? Uh, uh, they do not implement the complete full-fledged WS hyphen star specification. So because of that, you know, you cannot really build a complete SOA architecture using web services. So that's the first big difference. Second, uh, you know, by WCF, you know, you can host multiple protocols like HTTP, TCP, uh, you know, you can, means in other words, you can host your service on multiple protocols like TCP or HTTP. While in WCF services, you know, you, uh, sorry, in web services, you need to only use uh, the IIS and the HTTP protocol. Okay. What are address bindings and contracts uh, in WCF services? Uh, well, you know, address defines, uh, you know, the uh, where the service is hosted. So it defines a URL or the URI where we can locate the service. Uh, the binding defines, you know, what kind of protocol it is. Is it HTTP? Is it, is it you know, WS HTTP, basic HTTP? What kind of protocols uh, on which the service will host? And the contract basically defines uh, the necessary uh, data types, the necessary functions which are going to be exposed to the to the world. So it's more of like a like you know what interfaces are going to be used. So A, B, C are nothing but you know where, uh, how, and what. Okay. You have also used reporting services uh, uh, in your you also in your tools. You know I'm I, I can see reporting services. So what are the various ways by which you can consume reporting services? Reporting reports uh, in .NET or in ASP.NET. Uh, Okay, report, but there are two ways by you can by which you can consume reporting services in your ASP.NET project. The first one is by using the URL technology. So when we actually, uh, you know, when we actually publish a report in reporting uh, in reporting services, it's been hosted on IIS. So you know that is a you know it 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 has basically a RDL file, the report definition language file. So it hosts on the report server IIS, and uh, you know uh, and that IIS you know the the URL you can directly invoke and get the report. So one is the URL technology you can use, and the other one is I know we have a, a reporting control, uh, you know, a, a report viewer, which is given. You can use the report viewer to basically get the get the reports. So uh, you know, internally it actually makes a call to a web service. So you know, so so basically you can you can you know, summarizing you know there are two ways. One is a URL way, and another one is a web service way. So to implement the web service way, you need to use the report viewer. While the URL way, you can just give the URL from your application and, and the report runs. Okay. Uh, what's the use of Ajax? Uh, you know, Ajax, the main, uh, the main theme or the main purpose for which Ajax was put in ahead was as was was asynchronous processing. That's the first and second. You know, uh, it was it was mainly that you know you need you uh, you know it will actually it will not post all the data. So if you look at the old way of uh, building website applications, you know where uh, if you click on a button and if, if if you want to go to the server, then the then everything goes back, posts back, you know the browser refreshes and there is a synchronous processing. While in Ajax, you know uh, it only sends those data which are which have changed or which needs to be sent to the server. So if you have a page with thousand controls and you know you need to only refresh one or two controls, right? Then you can use Ajax. Uh, so let's say that I have a data grid, you know, and I want to make it Ajax enabled. So how do I do that? Oh, you can just wrap it, wrap it up with the update panel, and I think you know it should it should just work work like a asynchronous uh, control. Okay. Uh, you know, you you are also a part of design, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, yes, I've been a part of design documentation. Uh, so what's the difference between aggregation and composition? Uh, okay. Uh, 
okay aggregation means you know the lifetime of both objects are not same or you know uh, we can talk about one object without talking about the other object so they are more of a decoupled object and while in composition uh, lifetime of both of the objects are same uh, okay let me explain you what exactly it means you know let's say that uh, you have uh, what you call a class uh, let's say that you have an invoice class okay and uh, and the invoice class uh, invoice header class you know rather let me let me be specific let's say that you have an invoice header class and an invoice detail class now you cannot talk about the header class without the invoice detail class you cannot talk about the invoice details without the header class so this is a composition relationship now let's say that the invoice header is using an exception handling class you know so i can i can talk about the exception handling class without the invoice class so in other words the invoice class and the exception handling class lifetime are not same but the invoice header class and the invoice detail class both of the lifetime are same okay um you have uh, okay you have also worked with agile yeah i mean i'm a kind of i've i've looked into agile so in my current uh, project <coughs> i'm sorry in my current project i was using agile or i was a part of the agile team uh okay so so can you explain me uh, what's uh, in agile does testing come before uh, development or after development or within development how it is uh, it, you know agile the main principle of agile you know uh, 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 from the testing perspective is that you need to first test first write the test and then write the code so the the testing comes you know before before you start actually writing the code okay uh you have also used function points so yes i have used function point for estimation so what are the different parts of function points uh well function points are different aspects like you know external input external output external query external interface files you know so uh but you have also used wbs right i can see that there is wbs and there's also function points yeah i'm going to say in our in our organization what happens is that basically we do two estimates we don't do one estimate and then later we reconcile so that's why uh, you know you will see that i well versed with two two kind of estimation technology what was the productivity factor in function point you used uh, for dotnet it was 1.2 uh, 1.25 and for java it is like 0.7 1.2 is what it's function point per day okay uh, what's the difference between abstract class and interface um well you know abstract class uh, basically you know okay abstract class is nothing but it's a half defined class i mean you can't create object of abstract class so what you do is that you define your half half uh, functionalities or you define the partial class using the abstract class and then later you can define the concrete classes which inherit from the abstract class and define the complete implementation uh, while interface you know is is you know it's it basically defines a contract so so when you actually implement uh, so in so interfaces you know you don't inherit but you rather implement it so interface you can think about you know it's like a force contract uh, you know or a force contract or it has like a set of vocabularies you know which can be forced across the classes in a project so for example let's say that you have a class called customer you have a class called a supplier and you want that everybody should use the naming convention as update when they want to insert into the database so what you will do is that you will create a, a, a interface called as i crude and you will define a method on that called as update and then later all the crude classes will implement this interface and they will or and they will implement the or they will write the code for the update method so with that what happens is you know there is a there is a consistency of vocabulary across the project uh can we create object of interface no can we create object of abstract class and you know, as i've already said that abstract class is a half made functionality so you can't okay um you have used n unit for testing yes i have used uh, for unit testing i have used n unit mhm mm so uh, so from now now just coming to adio.net uh, uh in adio.net let's say that you no know, i want to implement uh, a more of like i want to implement optimistic locking so what are the ways you can do that uh well you know if you want to implement optimistic locking you know one is that you can just use the data adapter in case you are using the data set for update and delete uh, the other way is you know probably uh, in the sql server you can keep a time stamp and uh, what you do is that when you actually want to edit a record or update a record you read the time stamp when you actually read the record 
and then when you, when you go to update the record you will just check before updating that is the timestamp equal if the timestamps are equal that means that nobody has actually changed the record and if the timestamps are not equal then basically you will uh, just throw an error saying that uh, somebody else has updated the record now we need to see that what we can do for this okay uh, what's the use of link uh, okay uh, you know I know link is 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 a more of a is, is more of a what you call it, you can term it as a, as a common language you know uh, to access the data sources so it has a query language you know by which you know you can access any kind of data source for example you can have a data source using it's it has a sql you have sql data source at the back end you have excel so link basically provides a uniform query language by which you can query the excel records and you can get back okay or you can think about link as a or mapper uh -huh. okay So, and I, I'm also looking to your CV, and I find that in your current organization, you have only worked for one year. Yeah. So, any reasons of leaving? Uh, you know, well, you know, uh, uh, in the current organization, I was I moved toward the night shift, and uh, it's difficult at this moment because I have some personal problems, and I do not really, I can't really work in night shifts currently. So that's the only reason I'm leaving this company. The company is is really good, and you know, I've really learned a lot from this organization. But, uh, you know, if I could have changed uh, the night working, you know, I would have stayed, this, stayed in this organization for a longer time. Uh-huh. Model view controller. What's the use of model view controller? Uh, well, you know, MVC is a architectural, uh, is, a, is more of an architectural thing, you know. Uh, uh, it basically helps you to separate the model from the view and 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 the view from the controller. So basically, it gives you a model view controller kind of a, a look. So what happens is that your controller basically first takes in action, and depending on the action, it 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 goes to the model, takes the data, and that data it ties up with a ASPX page or a view. So you know by using model view controller, you are separating your model from the view and from the controller. There is also something called as a model view presenter. What basically is it? Okay, uh, model view presenter, you know, in model view presenter, what happens is basically uh, you have some reusable code. You, you write, you know, some kind of code in UI which can be used again and again. So what you do is that uh, you move your, uh, you have a presenter class actually, and all your UI code, you actually put it in your presenter class. When I say the UI code, the interaction of the UI. So your 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 UI basically interacts with the presenter, and the presenter interacts with the uh, what you call the model at the backend. So the presenter class is is you know so so what so so if you look at the the way model view controller is the first hit comes on the controller, while in model view presenter the first hit comes on the view, and the view actually then passes the data to the presenter, and the presenter fetches the data from the model and passes back to the UI. So basically the the presenter is like a bridge in between the model and the view. Okay. Uh, in object-oriented programming, uh, you know, what's the difference between abstraction and encapsulation? Because they, they look almost same, right? Uh, abstraction is nothing but, you know, you, be, you are basically exposing the necessary properties of the object. Or when you design the object, you say that, okay, these are the necessary pro properties and which needs to be exposed to the user. Well, encapsulation is where you actually hide the complexity. Uh, definitely both of them uh, you know complement each other like example when you actually hide the complexity in other words you are only going to expose the necessary functionality so you can think about abstraction as a concept you know where we actually visualize uh, or we only try to depict the necessary properties and methods uh, which need to be exposed to the external world while encapsulation is basically implementing abstraction so basically by hiding uh, the complexity you are you are trying to achieve that goal of abstraction okay What's uh, okay? Let's say that uh, you know you are you are you are working on on uh, what you call. Let's say that you know some some stored procedure of your SQL Server are, have gone slow. So, what will be your methodology by which you can really uh, check out the bottlenecks or you know zero on the bottlenecks? The first thing what I'll do in is in you know if I see that okay my server has gone down uh, tremendously slow, I'll run the SQL Server profiler, and by from the SQL Server profiler I'll generate a trace file. 
and that trace file I will give it to my index suggestion wizard and I will say that okay this is my trace file let me know that if I can create any kind of indexes and improve my performance okay what's the difference between a cluster index and a non cluster index uh, well the cluster index you know it basically points uh, okay both of them actually use the B tree fundamental to basically make search to do search so definitely your performance is increased by using either uh, you know either one of them now uh, when we talk about cluster index, you know, in cluster index, the key actually points to the actual data. So, in cluster index, the data is sorted as per the cluster index. While in non-cluster index, you know, the data actually points towards the towards the pointer, you know, and that pointer actually points to the data. So, non-cluster index, you know, the the logical way it is sorted, the non-cluster index are arranged. It's very much possible that the physical way is completely different. So that's why you can have n number of, or I'll say rather, you you can have uh, some 250 plus kind of. Uh, uh, 256 or 254 I'm not remembering the number currently but you can have you can have uh, many non cluster indexes but uh, you can have only one cluster index on a table okay uh, let's say that uh, in SQL server you see that uh, your uh, you, know, you run you run the query and you see that your query plan is showing that it's a table scan so what will you do uh, well, if it's a table scan and, and if there are like huge number of records, what I'll do is that I will just create an index on it so that, you know, it becomes an index scan. Because in table scan, what happens is, you know, it basically scrolls row by row to, to get the data, while in index scan, it actually, you know, uses indexes to get the data. Okay. So, is table scan good or, or I'm going to say, is table scan go bad for all situations? No, it's not like that. Table scans, uh, if the number of rows are very small, right, let's say you have 10 or 20 rows of master table, like let's say a country master which has like probably 30 or 40 records only. So in that case, it's definitely table scan are good. But let's say that you have like, you know, thousands of records, you know, then, then definitely you need to ensure that your query plan shows an index scan. What's the advantage of using stored procedures? Uh, stored procedures are pre-compiled, uh, you know, so, so basically, you know, it increases the performance. What is pre-compiled? I'm going to say. Can you explain that? The plan, basically, you know, the, the plan is pre-compiled. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, in your design document, you know, what kind of UML diagram have you used? Uh, okay, I have used uh, I've used class diagrams and uh, you know, class diagram to show the relationships and properties, etc. Uh, some of, for some of the complicated cases, uh, we had used sequence diagrams and uh, collaboration diagrams. What's the difference between a sequence and a collaboration diagram? A sequence diagram, you know, it, it basically shows uh, how the object, uh, the object messages over a lifetime, while in collaboration di uh, diagram, it basically shows the messages in terms of sequences. So one which uses, you know, which shows in terms of object lifetime, while the other one, you know, which shows in terms of uh, how the, ob you know, uh, which messages are sent from, uh, you know, in which sequence, you know. So one gives more importance to collaboration while the other gives more more importance to the sequence. Mm -hmm. Okay, this seems to be nice for me. Uh, so Shiv, you know, uh, now I'm done with my uh, question and answer session, you know, and I would like to know uh, if you want to ask me something. Uh, well, I would like to know, you know, what kind of role I'm going to play in the organization or what project I'm going to join in. Uh, oh, well, you know, we are a e small e-learning company, uh, www.crespon.com. Uh, uh, the role what you're going to play over here is more of a, a architect role. So basically, you need to manage your end-to-end -end activities of a project from the technical aspect. And uh, also, you will be liaising with the customer to get the requirements and ensure that we meet, uh, you know, we, we capture all the requirements, which we can, you know, convert from the requirement to the design and then from design to the code. So basically, uh, more of an end-to-end process, you know, which you are currently doing in organization. Okay. Uh, so just, you know, coming to the final thing, I would like to know what kind of remuneration package you are expecting. Uh, you know, uh, well, you know, currently in my organization, whatever I'm getting, you know, uh, currently the current organization, whatever I'm getting, uh, you know, my range, I think, you know, can be about uh, 15 to 20% of a hike, you know, or probably 20 to 25% of hike, you know. not sure, you know. So, completely depends on your organization policy and your HR policies. Okay. So, uh, thanks a lot, Shiv. You know, it was really nice talking to you and uh, my HR will get back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, you know, and I'll be waiting for your call.